We're so glad you're here to listen to this week's sermon from Park Street Church. Park Street is a historic congregation located in the heart of Boston. But more than that, we're a community of people from all different backgrounds who believe and are united by the good news that Jesus is Lord. If you're asking questions about God, your faith, or the meaning and purpose of life, we would love to connect with you. Visit us at parkstreet.org to learn about our community. We hope this sermon encourages you today. An outstanding local artist and educator is Bruce Herman. Uh, He lives in Gloucester and he teaches at Gordon College and he's been a longtime friend uh, of many of us here at Park Street Church. In in 1997, three bolts of lightning uh, uh, under a clear blue sky struck the three tallest pine trees on the the Herman property. It split all three of these pine trees, cooking the sap. Uh, The house is located on a a, a granite knoll, and there's very little soil. And so as the electricity went through these three trees, it had nowhere to go down into the ground. And so it followed through the root system, and it led into one of the the biggest roots, which went right into the basement window. Uh, The lightning struck the cast iron fuel tank and it unwelded both ends of the tank and it lit the fuel. And there was a tremendous explosion in the basement. Uh, Bruce was at the kitchen sink. He was washing the dishes, which I've heard him say it's a good reason not to wash the dishes. (laughs) And he said on each side of the sink were two electrical outlets. And a nanosecond after this explosion, he saw the plume of blue fire come out of one end, an envelope, and go around him and go into the other end. If it had touched him, it would have been certain death. Down below, 20 years of art that he had uh, done uh, was in a storage area in the driest part of the basement, and it was right next to the fuel tank. And in an instant, perhaps tens of thousands of hours of his art for two decades, as well as his entire house burned up in ash. Bruce was confronted that day with questions and with a decision. Would this fire consume not just his possessions, but his very mind and his purpose, his heart and his soul? Uh, Was this to be a destroying fire in his experience, or would it become a redeeming fire that would remake things? T.S. Eliot, he once wrote, we will all be consumed by either fire or fire. One fire destroys, another fire redeems. And I believe that's exactly what's going on in our text this morning in Leviticus chapter 6, and I encourage you to keep your Bible cracked open to Leviticus 6, verses 8 through 13. If we consider this fire that is a continual fire burning on the altar, I'd like to suggest to you that it is actually two fires that have been merged into one. Verse 13 says, the fire was to be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. And we'll spend a little bit of time trying to unpack this, but I believe that one fire represents fire of judgment that is the, that represents the continual eternal fire that we see in hell. But there is a second fire that's embedded in this fire on the altar that is continual, and it represents the continual presence of God, which is to be stoked and purified, and it redeems. And so each of these fires that exists on this altar at one time confronts us, and it confronts us, each fire, with uh, two decisions. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time unpacking each one of these fires. So the first fire represents a continuous destroying fire. When you think about the, the, the animal offering is on the altar, and this continual fire that's on the altar burns up the animal body into ash. And I believe it represents the 
the continuous judgment of sin and evil uh, that is to come. In fact, in the end of Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 66, he speaks of this continual fire judgment where he describes it as the worm shall not die and a fire shall not be quenched. But it's not just the Old Testament that talks about this continuous fire. We also find it very clearly in the New Testament, uh, most clearly, in fact, in the ministry of Jesus himself and his teaching ministry on the Gospels in Matthew chapter 25. Uh, Jesus describes the king, who is representative of God, saying to the right, unrighteous, he says, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire that's been prepared for the devil and his angels. Uh, he teaches elsewhere in Matthew 8, 12, for example, and there are multiple uh, scriptures that we could look at. In speaking to, he describes the Israelites who are only Israelites outwardly, but not Israelites truly in the heart, and saying to them, they will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place of hell, as we uh, read about it in the Bible, is described with multiple metaphors. There are worms. There's intense darkness. It's, there's, it's a bottomless pit. It's described as a lake, and it's, of course, described as this continuous, eternal fire. Uh, there, there are metaphors that describe a very real domain that is appalling, but they're metaphors. In fact, I don't think we can, uh, we have words or the experience to actually describe the very nature of what this eternal hell is like. And the reason is, is because we are surrounded by grace. Saving grace, but also common grace. Common grace, which is a representation of God's Spirit, which is always around us and always with us, creating many things. And no matter where we are or how terrible it is, His common grace remains with us. But not so in this eternal continuous fire. Something happens in that place in which God's very presence is removed. He, he removes himself from that space and it becomes a, a graceless vacuum. Notice the language where the, in Matthew 25, he says, depart from me. And so they go into a place where God is not. His grace is totally absent. The Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians 1.9 describes it as a domain away from the presence of the Lord. So whatever hell is, or however whatever metaphors uh, might describe it, it is clear that the, the grace of God is completely and totally and utterly absent from it. And when His grace is removed, there's something that also happens to us. You see, part of the judgment that uh, the Scripture describes is God releasing us or removing Himself, taking His presence and His grace away from us, and the effect of it is that we are left with ourselves and our own pride and our own self-absorption. Now, Romans 1 uh, very clearly teaches this, in which the judgment is God gives us over, the unrighteous, to their own desires. And when God lets you have what you want, that is the very beginning of what hell is. You begin to experience that graceless experience because it's His grace. It's His grace that doesn't give us what we want. It's grace that He gives what we need. In Luke chapter 16, where Jesus describes the experience of Lazarus and, and the rich man in that story, the rich man who is in the place that is like hell shows no repentance or faith in God He's still bossing Lazarus around. He's still prideful and arrogant in his position, even though he is there and Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham. And he's still primarily thinking about himself first. And that is the psychological and spiritual state of hell. Forget the surroundings around it and the metaphors we might use. It is us turning inward in and on ourselves, full of pride, Breathing and jealousy and bitterness and fear and the desire to control, all of which is part of this self-absorption. But that's not God's desire. It's not His desire for any one of us. God does not wish for any to perish, to perish in their own pride and self-absorption. He wants all of us to reach repentance. 
And as we consider uh, Leviticus and in the Old Testament, we discover these ceremonial laws which are intended to prepare us to understand the realities that are coming in the New Testament. In the Old, there's these shadows and these figures, but in Jesus Christ, what we experience is the, re the true reality of salvation in which all of these things become fulfilled. Well, one question I have is how does Christ save us from the continuous fire that is destroying? Uh, we, we, we're aware, we've been take, Mark has been taking us through how uh, sin was, was placed on the animal. And in being placing on the animal, it represented how sin was departing from you and put on the animal. And even so, Christ in his work on the cross became sin bearer, satisfying the, the justice of God. And just as one would confess over the animal one's own sins, the animal which was ceremonial pure, the purity of that animal was at least figuratively going to the confessor so that they now were considered innocent in God's sight. But that is a prefigurement of what Christ has done in his perfect life of moral perfection. His righteousness is imputed to us, or we heard the prayer a few minutes ago. It's an alien righteousness that has been given to us for whoever has faith in him. But what about the burnt, burnt offering? Where in, uh, in the New Testament do we see the fulfillment uh, in Christ of this uh, this eternal fire judgment represented in, the, in the, the burning, this continuous fire, where do we see it in the New Testament and in the work of Jesus? And, of course, the answer is we, we do not. The New Testament is silent in explaining if or how the burnt offering uh, is fulfilled in Christ. And so we're left to only speculate. And uh, I'll speculate at no extra charge to you. Scripture actually teaches that Christ, when he died, he descended into the grave or he descended into hell. It was this descent. We read about it in the New Testament reading in Ephesians 4, where he descended somewhere. We, we read in other places, for example, in Acts 2, in Peter's sermon, we're told that Christ was in Hades, that's the word that he used, under the pangs of death. In Romans 10, verse 7, it says that Jesus descended into, and it uses the word abyss, which is the same word uh, that John uses in Revelation 9-2, referring to a bottomless pit. He describes it as a bottomless pit burning with a fiery furnace. And this is why throughout the Christian tradition there has been a general, not complete, but a general belief and an affirmation of what we say and confess in the Apostles' Creed, that he descended into hell. Now, there are actually two, and I'll simplify this, there are two primary main views that Christians have held over the centuries of what it means for Christ to have descended into hell. Uh, the first view has been held by uh, the Eastern Orthodox as well as by uh, Lutheran Protestants who have in interpreted the descent of Christ into hell as primarily a victory. It's a victory in which he knocks down the gates of hell and he preaches to the abode of the, the dead. The other view uh, has been held mostly within the Reformed Protestant tradition who have understood the descent of Christ into hell as the final part of the Son of God's humiliation in which he has been separated now completely from the Father in total absence, as we discussed in a moment ago about hell. And in this descent, the fires of hell fell down upon Christ in his dereliction. Well, I see no reason why both views cannot actually be true for what happened on that Saturday between crucifixion and resurrection. As sin bearer, Christ descended into hell. He descended into hell in the humiliation in which that continuous destroying fire fell and rained upon Jesus himself. All of it poured on to him. And there is the fulfillment of Christ as the one true burnt offering. He experienced the total and utter absence of the Father. But there was this strange reversal. 
even within that place of dissent, a moment of total reversal in which, at least in my mind's eye, I imagine the fires of hell falling upon the crucified Christ in, uh, in that place. And in the moment, it, the fire of God, which was in Christ as God, the God-man, all the fires went into him and he absorbed them all, extinguishing the fires of hell. And then there he began his ascent into resurrection and at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And in that, uh, he was that lesser fire, the fires of hell, were consumed by the very fire of God. Uh, and so, in his ascent, the gates of hell were knocked down. The principalities and powers were disarmed. Leviathan, uh, as it described, Leviathan was led with a hook. And as the resurrected Son of God, he saves all those who call upon him, he saves them from that continuous destroying fire. Uh, Bruce Her Herman uh, writes about his own sp uh, spiritual pilgrimage that he, uh, as a younger man, rejected Christ because of the church's dismissive attitudes towards those who were in the arts. And as a young man going to Boston University, uh, he became thrilled with Buddhist meditation and he began following the guru Meher Baba. Uh, Baba, who was uh, well known at the time, uh, affirmed the importance of art because he taught that the universe itself was imagination, which became a very attractive idea to many artists at the time. Baba stressed an inner journey of realization that culminated in a final stage of what he called involution, in which the soul fully realized its God self. Salvation was that moment of realization of a God realization, that I am God. And Bruce Herman's spirituality became, as he followed this, it became deeply inward. And self-realization, he says, and the arts became his idol. And he was following it as a good disciple, following it its, to its logical ends. And in doing so, uh, he, it was destroying his marriage. And uh, finally, one day, his wife Meg uh, asked for a divorce. It thunderstruck uh, in, in a different way, Bruce, at that time. And he began to see that the very religion that he was following was pushing him not only into some level of self-discovery, but to self-absorption. And he began to realize that that self-absorption was the very path of hell and of what hell would be. And so he and Meg, uh, they turned to Christ, and it was Christ who saved their marriage. It saved his art. And it had saved, ultimately, Bruce and his wife and his children and the many people uh, who have been blessed by their ministry uh, for uh, several decades. As we can consider this continuous fire uh, that is on the altar burning the offerings, we're faced with a decision, a decision that Bruce had to make. Would he put his faith in Christ as the one true burnt offering, or will you continue to follow that path consumed with ego and self-absorption, leading to its logical end, which is the fires of eternity? So I'm suggesting to you that this continuous fire actually represents two fires. There's two fires merged into one on the altar. One represents this destroying fire, but there is another symbolic system going on at the same fire as we pull them apart, and it represents the redeeming fire of God's presence. Uh, one way that God reveals his character is in the presence and form of fire, and we see it both in the Old and New Testaments. Of course, God in his essence is invisible and immaterial, and our minds and our imaginations and our concepts cannot possibly describe God. And so he reveals himself in what theologians call theophany. It's an appearance of himself within a material form in order to teach us and to reveal something about himself, about his invisible nature. In Genesis 15, God appears to Abraham as a smoking pot and a flaming torch. And in Exodus 19, the Lord descended on Mount Sinai in a terrible uh, fire-smoke constellation. 
In the vision of Daniel, he, he sees God's throne encircled with fire. In Revelation, the Apostle John, he sees the risen Christ with eyes like flames of fire. And in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit descends and baptizes the church with tongues of fire. And these are just some of the examples that we see in the scriptures. In Leviticus chapter 6, this continuous fire, which is mentioned three times in our text, that it's continual and to be kept continually, it symbolizes not only that destroying fire, but it symbolizes a redeeming fire. And I think uh, the way we can understand this redeeming fire is that it, the fire of God is to be stoked as well as submitted to. Let's consider that as we consider the stoking of the fire of God on the altar, His presence, which re translates into increasing worship in our hearts. In verse 13, it says, The priests were told that the fire shall not go out. So the priests then were on call all the time. They had to keep the, the fire burning. And this was, I think, metaphorically to show or to represent to Israel that God was wanted Israel and his people to maintain uninterrupted, unceasing worship because he's worthy of such worship. He's worthy of your heart always being focused on him and maintaining a continual fire would require the priests to prepare and be disciplined and to use teamwork in order to accomplish this command. I'm sure some were responsible for the wood and they had to make sure it was, it was cut and it was dry and it was stacked and there was enough for the, for the next day. They had to work in shifts. Some had to watch it and stoke it. Uh, uh, they had to work day and night. They had to work in rain or shine. Uh, in the heat waves of the day and in the snow of the night, 365 days of the year. And perhaps you could imagine yourself, if you were tasked that one night in the snow to, uh, to keep the fire going, I don't know what you would say, but I would say to myself, the fire ain't going out on my watch. But Israel did let the fire go out. And Christians, it is very easy for us to be very casual in our worship of God and to let our relationship with God go out. When I was uh, first beginning uh, to preach, I had uh, the privilege of one sermon in which there was an older man who I think uh, suffers from narcolepsy. And during the middle of the sermon, he, he fell asleep. He was snoring so loudly that no one could even hear what I was saying. They just heard him snoring, filling the entire room. Now, I know that I can bore, but I really don't think I'm that weary. <laughs> Am I? Don't answer the question. <laughs> but as opposed to a physical disorder, we all have a spiritual disorder that makes us spiritually apt to fall asleep, both individually and corporately. The truth is we can all very easily let the fire dim or to go out. Where's your fire? What's its condition today? Well, how do we keep the spiritual fires going, especially in our own hearts? Well, there are things you probably have heard before, but they're the right answers over and over again. We need to make daily time for scripture reading and meditation and for regular times of, of prayer. We need to practice weekly rest, and we need to prepare for, did you prepare yourself as you came to worship today? You need to prepare for and engage with all of your heart the worship of the Lord in, in our congregation. And I think we also, in order to keep the fires going, we need to get involved in some kind of spiritual small group in which we are encouraging one another and keeping one another accountable. Not being involved in some kind of small group is like trying to tend the fire all on your lonesome 24-7, 365. But motivation, your motivation to do this can't be guilt. And I hear, as a pastor, I hear many of you expressing guilt around these sorts of 
practices. I'm so bad, I wish I prayed more, I should be more involved. But I know firsthand that guilt doesn't work. It doesn't work. Well, what does work? What helps kindle the fires and keeps it moving? Well, it's the, it's the positive things, like meditating on the love of God, allowing yourself to reflect on Him, practicing thanksgiving, even for the things that are hard, and repeatedly in prayer, forgiving those that hurt you, because that just gets in the way, and it makes it hard to worship and to know God. And when you put the positive motivations combined with these spiritual practices, uh, and you put it all together, good things happen. The fire is kindled, and it can even be ablaze. So are you doing that? Will you do that? Will you stoke the fire within yourself? You need to do it, and you need to do it together. But you see, the continual fire of the presence of God is not just something that we do. We don't just stoke it. Because the, the presence of God operates in His sovereignty and works on us, requiring us to submit to the fire's burn. God's fire consumes all that is unworthy into ash. In verses 10 and 11, it says, The priest shall put on his linen garment, put his linen undergarment on his body, and he shall take up the ashes to which the fire has reduced the burnt offering on the altar and put them beside the altar. And then he shall take off his garments and put on other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. You see, the fire, this continuous fire, produces ash. And that ash, in order to keep the fire going, needs to be removed. And our reality is our soul. Our soul clings to so much that is unworthy of God. And the Holy Spirit, He works. He works in various ways, determining what to burn away, but only in order to redeem you and me. And that burning, it hurts. It, it, it can be terribly painful. Uh, and the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, he says it this way, the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. The work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but as only through fire. I, I, I certainly find myself asking the question, what am I doing, what am I involved in that is turning only into ash? And I know for myself, and I assume you probably know too, that so much of what you give your time to, your energy, perhaps lots of consternation, in the end is just dust and ashes. And so we have to ask ourselves and review our own, our own actions, wondering what am I doing that's going to last? last into eternity. But uh, I, I don't think any of us can ask the question, and really fully uh, we won't ask the question, and so the sovereign spirit must come along uh, in taking action for us, revealing things that should not be there, and burning them away in order to redeem. Well, this continual fire, as we're reflecting on in Leviticus 6, are actually two fires that we see merged together as one. This one fire destroys, but the other redeems. And these two fires confront us all to reflect and to make decisions. The first decision is this, is my faith in Christ, in Christ as my true one burnt offering, this Christ who has saved me. This Christ who frees me from all of my self-absorption, which if left to myself will only lead to utter eternal ruin. Is your faith in Him? Or is it in something else or in yourself? The continual fire also forces another decision. And I can orient it around this question. Shall I submit to the Spirit's will? as he burns away into ash all that is in my life that is not worthy of him. And in submitting to his will and having the ash removed, will I then stoke the fires within me into growing, deepening worship? 
I think this continual fire that we read here in Leviticus 6 is a call, a call to ask ourselves both of these questions. Writing uh, in the Four Quartets, uh, the famous poet T.S. Eliot, uh, also a Christian, I think captures this reality quite perfectly in his poem. He says, the dove descending breaks the air with flame of incandescent terror, of which the tongues declare the one discharge from sin in error. The only hope, or else despair, lies in the choice of pyre or pyre, to be redeemed from fire by fire. Who then devised the torment? Love. Love is the unfamiliar name behind the hands that wove the intolerable shirt of flame, which human power cannot remove. We only live, only suspire, consumed by either fire or fire. Bruce Herman was also confronted with a decision. Their house was burnt down, 20 years of his artwork destroyed, burned down to ash in under an hour. And out of a blue sky, he experienced what the insurance company called an act of God. <laughs> well, what would they do? Well, that night of the fire, Bruce and his wife, Meg, they, they stayed at a friend's house, and their friends were already planning on going dancing. And so they went too. Can you imagine going to a dance on the night your house burns down? And in the dancing, Bruce and Meg that night realized together that God was God and all was well. And I heard Bruce say uh, that his art was tested by God and found wanting. <laughs> but he didn't interpret this catastrophe to mean that he was no longer to be an artist or he was to leave the arts. Rather, for Bruce, it became a turning of the tide to pursue God all the more with the rest of his life. And that fire and that event informed so much of what Bruce has done over the last 25 years. It's informed his very painting methods of making and breaking, breaking and remaking. And you can see videos of how he does it. It's, 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 it's a wonderful, amazing, and how he, he paints. I, I'm, I marvel at it as I see it. It informed his uh, painting methods, but it also in, informed the themes of his art. Some of his exhibits have been broken beauty or building out of the ruins or ordinary saints. But it also changed his identity as an artist and the mindset. I heard him say in a lecture, quote, the fire was the best thing that ever happened to me. As an artist, I've learned to let go of my illusion that I am in charge of my life and to be surprised and submitted to the presence of God. Brothers and sisters, would you lay yourselves before the fire of God submitting to him in surprise, dancing before him even in the burning, and allow him to use you in ways that will fill you with joy and awe and wonder. O oh Lord, do this in our midst. Holy Spirit, do not let one person here leave without having truly meditated in their mind's eye upon your holy fire. And Lord, may we all leave here changed because your word shall not return void. In Jesus' name, amen.